Welcome to Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with District of Saanich Councillor Colin Plant. The District of Saanich is nestled on the southern tip of Vancouver Island and is a vibrant and diverse community that seamlessly blends urban amenities with natural beauty. Known for its lush landscape, Saanich boasts an array of parks, gardens, and protected green spaces. The district's commitment to environmental sustainability is evident in its numerous community gardens, prompting a strong sense of community engagement. With a strong focus on local businesses and a thriving art scene, Saanich provides a balanced lifestyle for its residents. Whether you're enjoying the local's farmer's market, participating in outdoor activities, or immersing oneself in cultural events, the District of Saanich embodies the essence of a welcoming and livable community on the picturesque Vancouver Island. This is Cross-Border Interviews with Councillor Colin Plant. Colin, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the persona behind the counselor's position. And I want to get by starting the age-old question on the show is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Colin? Thank you for the question. It's great to join you on this podcast. I've listened to several of them, and I think you do a great job of uh, getting into the issues of how people came to be leaders and what they see as the issues in their jurisdiction. But to answer your question, uh, when I was a young boy in the small town of Sycamus, BC, around 1500 when I was a kid, uh, there wasn't a lot to do. And so Boy Scouts and Cubs were one of the few organized activities where you could participate and parents could have their children busy and not get into trouble, which sometimes happens with small towns. And so being a Boy Scout, you give back to the community, you learn about service, you learn about giving uh, your time to activities, to raise funds, to help people who are in need. So between that and also both of my paternal grandparents served in World War II, there was a sense of you give back to the community you live in. And we are, most of us, very proud to live where we live. And so if you like where you live, I think there is an obligation to give back to those communities so that they stay that way. And the old Boy Scout adage of try to leave things a little better than when you found them, specifically when you talk about camping, has always um, been an adage that works for me. And so I've always believed that you give back to your community and that's just part of being a citizen. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to start with this. Service comes in many different ways, volunteerism, nonprofits, but you chose the political route to give back yeah. to your community. What was going on in 2014 that made that Boy Scout, that internal Boy Scout say, I want to leave the District of Saanich better than I'm getting it? What was going on in 2014 that made you say, okay, it's time to go into this realm to sort of give my service to my community? Good question. Uh, when I was looking at the election in 2014, I actually, about 10 months beforehand, started thinking, I'm really enjoying the work I'm doing leading a community association. I ran to be a vice president of my local community association within Saanich, and nobody ran for president. So by being the vice president, I was automatically asked, well, would you serve as president? Because the duties of the vice president are just serve as president. So when I took that on, I enjoyed connecting with the community, giving feedback to council, uh, what was going on in our part of the municipality. And because I had always actually, ever since I was a little kid, been interested in government, uh, because I saw government as a place where you can help people uh, and it was something that we should all want to do if we want to help each other. Was so, it always uh, municipal, though? Was it always no. municipal? <laughs> no. When I was a little boy, uh, my mom kept, and I will get back to why 2014, but when I was a little boy, you know how uh, parents will often keep scrapbooks of your year to year, like who your friend was, what your favorite food was, who your teacher was. When I was five years old, my parents uh, documented what did you want to be when you grew up, and it was the government. 
uh, it wasn't a member of parliament. It wasn't an MLA. It wasn't a mayor. It wasn't a council. It wasn't the government. So I don't think it's because I wanted to be a bossy person because I'm not a bossy person. Which sometimes when you're five years old, you might prescribe the government as being bossy. But it, it was uh, federal when I was a little person uh, because I, I love Canada. So 2014, I'm currently in the role of vice president. I essentially become the president of the community association and I'm enjoying the work so much. And I think that I bring a pragmatic mind to local governance issues. And I understand that our role is governance. It's not operational. And I think that's a big distinction that some councillors uh, sometimes don't remember or don't realize that is their job. So in Saanich, there had been a history prior to 2014 of very little change in council. Our mayor had been mayor for 18 years and all eight of the council members were running again and rarely did anybody ever have uh, an election where someone would be voted out or not successful in their re-election. So truthfully in 2014, I thought, well, I'll run, but really I'll get in again if I try perhaps in 2018 or 2022 even, because one of my council colleagues when I first got in had run four times before he got in. So when I ran in 2014, it was like, the, I think I'm ready. I'd like to try and realizing that I may not get in. And what uh, was amazing to me is that I had incredible support and I actually came in second out of about 17 councillors by three votes. And I was elected as well to our regional district through an informal referendum. So what turned out to be uh, a life-changing event started with, well, I'll maybe get in. And by the time the election night came, I thought maybe eighth, wouldn't it be great if I could get in eighth? And then to come in um, second by three votes was a, a real wonderful uh, experience. Now, correct me if I'm wrong uh, for a second here, Colin, but that election in 2014, there was a big turnover on council. It wasn't just like you and then seven other incumbents. There was a massive, not massive, but a large turnover oh, it was. compared to previous elections. I think you're right to say it was a massive change because of the uh, election of a new mayor. Uh, in 2014, the man who had been mayor for 18 years lost the election. And uh, there ha had been... Uh, his voice on council for 28 years. And so all of a sudden you had a new mayor and two new councillors. So I was one of two. And so those three of us were quite a change for that council that had been advancing things in a way that had worked for a long time. And they, they kind of knew each other. They didn't agree on everything, but they kind of had a working relationship where they moved forward. And so unfortunately that uh, term was marked by a lot of acrimony between the mayor and council. Uh, we almost immediately when that council was uh, formulated, we had the loss of our CAO. And so that uh, created a lot of uh, instability. And so much of the term was spent trying to reconcile what needed to be done, which was we needed a new CAO, but we didn't want to throw away everything that had occurred to date because two thirds of council actually had been returned. So while they did want a new mayor, um, it wasn't a complete change of council. So it was hard that 14. And then in 2018, that mayor was unelected. Uh, by one of the other two councillors who had been uh, new to council with me in 2014. And now here in 2022, we have another new mayor. And in what can only be described as almost a soap opera, it's uh, a councillor who had been on council for 10 years and didn't run again in 2018. So it's a, it's a renewed uh, relationship for that mayor with council. And, and a lot of the council members have gone, but there are a couple who are still there. It, it sounds like the days of our lives, the uh, Saanich edition, but here we are in 2024. Unfortunately, uh, it did have that uh, that <laughs> vibe, I guess you would describe it. Um, now you have been, this will be your 10th year. So coming into your 10th year on council from 2014 to 2024, you have probably seen a gambit of issues that have come across your desk. You have seen the challenges that come with municipal governments. You have seen the challenges of working with provincial governments as they turn over because you've worked with both the P BC Liberals and the BC NDP. Um, in your role of councillor, has the role changed that dramatically where you're dealing with issues you were not dealing with when you first were elected in 2014? That's a really good question. I, I think the basic answer is yes, things have changed. Because when I first was elected, there was a real emphasis on, quote, stay in your lane. 
<laughs> right? Deal, de deal with the, yeah, it's an it's a, it's a expression I think every counselor in this country has probably heard. Stay in your lane. And so when we first started in 2014, and the three of us who I recognized earlier in the podcast as being uh, new to council, we had some new ideas. We thought we needed to make some change. And so the, the adage of stay in your lane was already being tested by us just having new ways of doing things in Sandwich. What's occurred over the last 10 years in, in my terms um, council is seeing that people are actually no longer always wanting you to stay in your lanes. There are some things that they, uh, the public would ask you to stay in your lane on, for example, talking about world conflicts, perhaps talking about nuclear weapons, things that really aren't germane on a day-to-day -day operational level for the municipality. But housing and healthcare, which are in British Columbia under the responsibility of the province, and I suspect most of the provinces across country because federal government is in a complicated relationship with provinces on housing and healthcare. People at the municipal level are now being told you do need to engage on these issues. And so we have gone in Saanich from being a fairly slow developing, growing community at a pace that's relatively small to now being told by the province, you need to meet these housing targets and you're going to have to triple your output. And so that is challenging because that expectation is coming from the province now, as well as from our residents that they want us to speed things up. So yes, there has been a change in the issues, but it's more the rapidity of it before we'd be approving a few, uh, applications uh, per month and now we're probably doing three times that per month so the, the flow has become heavier and the public I think is, is no longer saying we just want the provincial government to deal with uh, health care and, and daycare for example so when Saanich applications are put forward we almost always are asking what are you trying to do to perhaps retain doctors or what are you doing to uh, see if daycare could be a part of this multifamily uh, proposal. So it has changed over time, but the big issues of, like I say, uh, uh, world of politics, which there's never a dearth of topics to talk about, has been something we've been able to refrain from talking about. How hard is that in 2024 when you have residents asking you about questions that are you know are not in your jurisdictional purview? You talk about health care. You talk about even education, daycare. Yes, there are some things that municipalities can do, recruitment. They can sort of uh, yeah. entice doctors to come. But at the end of the day, you do not have a say over what goes on in the hospital. You have, do not have a say on what, if there's a hospital closure, an emergency room closure, or a lack of doctor shortages. You sort of have to play in the sandbox that you were being given. Yeah. How hard is that for a municipality like Saanich where you are so close to your community? You are the closest to them. You don't go yeah. off to the capital. You don't go off to auto to do your job. So when you go to the grocery store, I'm assuming the majority of people will probably know who the heck you are and will probably stop you and ask you questions about issues on a range of things. And you have to just tell them, we would love to help. We would love to be able to solve this with you, but unfortunately, we are constrained by the tools that the province or the federal government has given us. Yes, <laughs> is, the, <laughs> is the short answer. But I, I actually, you piqued my interest when you said, uh, do I get stopped in the grocery store? And, and while that is a, a, an adage that you hear all the time is you must get stopped in the grocery store, I've been elected for 10 years now. I've served as the regional district of 450,000 people here as chair for six years. I think I've been stopped in the grocery store once to what? talk about issues. Yeah, I don't think people recognize me or perhaps they realize that uh, there's other ways to get a hold of me. I, okay. I will come back to your question about So, But I'm going to challenge you a lot, little bit on that yeah. for a second because is it they don't know who you are or is there an apathy when it comes to municipal politics and municipal government in Saanich? Because I will be blunt and I will be the first to admit this and this is me saying this, is not the councillor saying this, so anyone who's listening to this, just throw your emails towards me, not the councillor. I think there is a massive apathy within Canada around municipal politics. Unless your taxes go up, unless there's something going on with your water not being turned on, they do not traditionally know who the heck your municipal councillor is. They will know the names of your MPs. They will know you the names of the MLA. They may not know what they look like, but 
the average person can't name every single member of council, in, in my opinion. I don't disagree. And the numbers of who shows up to vote verifies your opinion. You can't uh, assert that the public is well aware of what you're doing when less than 40% of them show up to vote. Now, the 40% that show up to vote probably are more engaged, but the fact that we're not reaching 60%, a majority, is a problem. Uh, it is something that I realize all the time that when we make decisions, who are we not hearing from? Because the reality is the people who are most impacted do show up, but those don't always reflect the full uh, array of voices that we are hearing from. So apathy is absolutely something that we face. And, and I would offer, I think the, one of the reasons that is the case is because it doesn't receive as much media attention. The issues that we deal with at the local government level, unless your water pipe blows up and all of a sudden creates a, a wonderful visual of, of some devastation to a property or a, or a street, it does, tends not to be covered. So what gets covered gets attention. And so what's typically covered are the big provincial and federal issues. And the reason why they get covered is they're typically based in conflict. And I think that's a big thing to talk about at the municipal level versus provincial and federal. At the municipal level, our job is to represent the entire municipality. And I know the province would say, oh, our job is to represent the whole province too. But there's an understanding that there's a party in power and they're going to implement their mandate. With the local government and with regional districts, what your power should be based on is your strategic plan and your strategic priorities. That's your mandate because the public gets to weigh in on your uh, strategic plan. They get to give you feedback. So from my perspective, because so much of local government is typically about working together, it doesn't generate the conflict that leads to media attention. And therefore, public is not paying attention. Is there an apathy within the district? Do you believe that people are willing to give their opinion on issues? So you're right municipalities that give get try to get input about strategic plans all the time but uh the average person probably hears the word strategic plan they probably would not know what that meant if you weren't in the context of a uh, municipality they're just happy to go about their business when you go out and ask for people's opinions and i say yeah. all people because you're right you as a counselor have to represent everyone not just the people who voted for you but the people who didn't as well how important is it for you to get all the opinions, not just the ones who agree with you, not just your echo chambers, but the people who will say things online or yeah. talk about things on, uh, throw things out there when it comes to giving feedback and talk to everyone and not just the people in your echo chamber? Yeah, I think the main job that a counselor does, if you were to say job description counselor, colon, adjudicator really what we do is adjudicate and so our job is to adjudicate everything whether or not it's a staff report whether or not it's public input uh, whether or not it's an application that someone wants to do something in your district your job is to adjudicate so when it comes to feedback it is incredibly important to adjudicate and so i put a lot of uh, value in statistically valid surveys and so the district of saanich because we're 115,000 people and have a fairly uh, significant workforce, we're able to do certain things that I know smaller districts can't. So we do citizen satisfaction surveys every uh, four years to get a sense of how are our residents and how are our businesses feeling about how things are going. So the statistically valid surveys, of course, are designed to capture the feeling of your municipality and not just those special interest groups that may want to show up when you have an issue that's important to them. So while we uh, take in all feedback and, and our council, we invite people from all over the world to participate in our meetings. We have people from outside of our jurisdiction who weigh in. Now, the job of course is you adjudicate that. Someone says they wanna see a six story apartment building, which for us would be big. Uh, if they're calling from Vancouver, we thank them for their input, but the person who lives next door, we're probably going to adjudicate their feedback a little bit differently. So the obligation on a council, I think, is to find ways to give the opportunity for your residents to give you feedback. Always get feedback. But then you have to adjudicate that based on, is this a small vocal minority? Is it a vocal majority? And then, of course, you apply it 
to your strategic frameworks. If you have policies and an OCP that say one thing, and then you go out and you do feedback and you hear from a minority saying you need to change that. Well, you then have to say, is this a time when we need to go back and look at our strategic priorities and an OCP and make a change? Or is this something that, yes, we're hearing from this group of people, but it's not really the time to make the change. And so that's always a delicate adjudication. So uh, we say decision making, but I often use the term adjudicate because you're truly trying to balance all things. So that is the biggest challenge for us. We've just gone through a process here in Saanich, uh, a people, pets and park strategy uh, that largely ended up being about dogs and being on or off leashes in our parks. And what we found was that in the statistically valid survey, we had a very different outcome than the self-selected survey. The self-selected survey was predominantly filled out, or not predominantly, a majority of people were dog owners. But we know in Saanich, with our statistically valid survey, only about a third of people are dog owners. So that was an interesting experience because we heard from the public who were largely dog owners, but yet when we did our survey, we noticed that it was only about a third of the municipality were dog owners. So that's an example of how do you adjudicate? Because certainly we heard from the people who are dog owners what they were looking for and what they were not wanting to see. But yet when we had done the statistically valid survey, we had a different set of responses. And so that adjudication is really tough. Sometimes you have to make a decision that you believe is in the best interest of the municipality, even though some of the feedback you've received is not going to be shown in that greater uh, opinion it's going to be held as a as a different opinion and that's hard uh, when you have a room full of people who are not in agreement with the decision that perhaps the rest of the municipality is and we do all acknowledge i think as councillors that the often decisions are made based on who shows up and gives you the feedback so should you over adjudicate in the favor of the people who show up to make an issue versus a statistically valid survey is a constant struggle you have before we turn to segment two, and I want to talk about the district and some of the issues sure. and challenges and accomplishments that the district is going through. You have been uh, now on council for ten years. You were just yep. re recently reelected, almost sixteen months ago in November or of October of twenty twenty two, and I can imagine you have grown as a councillor yourself. You personally have you the councillor that I'm speaking to today is probably completely different than the councillor I would have sp spoken to in twenty fourteen. Oh, yeah. What advice would you have given yourself then, knowing what you know now? And what advice would you give other first-term counselors who are in the role right now? Because we are seeing Yukon, Nova Scotia, uh, Saskatchewan, and going to the polls this year to elect brand new municipal councils. What advice would you give a prospective new counselor? Wow, that's a question that I feel I could probably do a whole day on, but to try and to, to, to get into some key ones. I think everybody who serves wants to make their community better. And so the way in order to do that, in my opinion, is you have to be impactful in devising your strategic plan. Staff uh, in an organization such as a municipality don't uh, do anything except hopefully enact the strategic plan as it's been funded by council. And so if you want to see outcomes in your community that are either the same or different, it's loading it into your strategic plan. So realizing that if you want to achieve something, you get it into your strategic plan. So that would be number one. Number two is, is perhaps realizing that do you need to ask a question? Is it for you or is it to better help you make the decision or is it to be political? And so my advice to colleagues is those council meetings should be decision-based meetings. And so they are intended to be a time for council to get, come together. And if it's a new policy, sure, maybe a committee of the whole discussion where you're, you're hashing it out. But if it's a council meeting, typically you're coming to make a decision. And so I would give the advice of talk to staff about what you need to know prior to the meeting. Because if you're in a chamber with eight, other councillors, six, five, whatever size your municipality, larger ones, even more, there is no need for you to ask questions that aren't going to help you make the decision in that council meeting. 
Council meetings should be about questions and comments to help make the decision. So just realize that what I would call, I don't want to say sacred because it almost sounds like it has a religious aspect, but realize that that council meeting is an important time and it really should be about helping the council make decisions and move forward. That, and of course, always trust your gut. Your gut is what pr people probably want you to apply when you make these adjudications or these decisions. And so if you feel you're in the minority, accept that and vote uh, the way you need to. But I would say always be true to yourself. It's an old Shakespeare adage, right? To thine own self be true. And then it follows that you cannot be false to any other person or something like that. I'm sorry, I butchered it. Uh, but that is a true adage too. It's okay to be on the eight one losing side of a vote if that's what you believe so don't you don't have to play nice anything play respectfully and but do follow your gut and uh and of course i think the other thing is have an open mind it's it's a very uh, positive thing when the community can come and talk to you and see the result of a change and that you, talking to you made a difference have you ever gone into a council meeting thinking you're going to vote on an issue a certain way and then change your mind after hearing what you've heard during that council meeting, whether it be through delegations, whether it be through uh, what a fellow councillor or even the mayor has said where you say, oh, I yeah. didn't think of it that way. And it goes back to that changing your mind aspect. How important is it for you to keep an open mind on all issues, even when we do have those unconscious biases within ourselves? Oh, for sure. I think there's a there's the legal requirement at a public hearing. Of course, you have to legally have an open mind uh, in British Columbia. Uh, but when it comes to council meetings and, and issues like that, uh, you don't always have to. In fact, it's it's entirely possible that you have a closed mind on certain issues. However, to answer your question, yes, most certainly I've had my mind change. Usually, it happens to be honest from my colleagues debate rather than the public perspective uh, but it has happened when the public weighs in and, and that's a, a good thing too so I, I don't have an ego about always having to stay true to my vote I will say during a meeting well after what I've heard I think we need to go in a different direction and it may not be that I'm in the majority in that it may be that I'm then in the minority or, or perhaps I switch so yes I, I take pride in having an open mind and and I suspect some of my colleagues would say that Collins, one of the counselors that can be persuaded. And I consider that a good thing. I don't consider that a weakness. I think it's healthy to, to listen to what is said and then say, yeah, you know what? I'm actually willing to go in a different direction. Knowing that any decision is going to have a majority. And there's, I always find a lot of, uh, not comfort, solace or something, but I, I have faith in a system where a majority of people believe this is the way to go. I may not always agree. But I have faith in that. And, and sometimes, actually, I will disagree, but I have faith in the process. And, and that's uh, respect for the institution. So I want to turn to the second segment because I'm very cautious yep. of time. And I want to talk no about problem. the District of Sandwich. But before I do that, I preface this, this segment always with this statement. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not an opinion of counsel. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not even a direction of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. He has one vote on counsel and that's it. So with that being said, I'm getting pretty good at just rambling that off very you are. quickly after I've I've heard it before. 80 questions. Um, counselor, because I want to make sure I do this correctly. Counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode today, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing the District of Saanich today or issues? Yeah, I, I think it's not going to be a surprise for anybody who lives in the southern Vancouver Island area that housing is the challenge and housing affordability. Uh, our region is one of the most expensive in Canada, and that's partly because of the fact that it's so desirable to live and the fact that we don't have an abundance of land. The southern part of Vancouver Island is largely built out and the rural areas are designated in our regional district uh, growth strategy as being areas we want to keep rural. So within Saanich, we had a massive population boom in the 60s and 70s. And as a result of that, we had a proliferation of single family homes, which was wonderful in the time period. Now we are in a situation where our population is growing. People are having children and, and people want to live here. People want to retire to this part of the region, but we don't have enough space for people to move here. So we have inadequate housing. So the municipality 
is a, I think a beautiful municipality because we have this lovely rural urban mix and we've had an urban containment boundary as a policy tool to shape where we want to have growth. But these growth nodes along corridors and centers and villages, which most people would say, well, that's where you should build housing is near the services, near, the, near where uh, people can make uh, transportation choices, are currently often found to be full of single family homes. And so you'll have a busy force uh, lane corridor where yes, thousands of people traverse that, but people live in those single family homes along there or they rent there. And so we as a council have said, we need to densify along our corridors. And while most people would agree with that, and when we do adopt our official community plan, and we say, this is what we want to do, we are seeing the support for that. But then when you actually have the rubber hitting the road and you have an application come forward that is uh, saying, we're gonna try and fulfill your official community plan, you have the people who live in those houses saying, we don't want our neighborhood to change. And so that is the difficulty for, for decades, Sandwich has been full of single family homes and now we're having to densify. And so what is a large project here in Sandwich, as I said earlier, are six stories, which I'm sure some of my larger uh, municipality colleagues would just say, wouldn't it be nice to only be building six stories? That is significant for us. And so housing is one. And then the other big one that I think is probably true for every municipality in, in British Columbia and probably Canada is affordability. And, and the interplay between what's going on at the federal, provincial, and in the private sector of how are we affording everything? Uh, municipal uh, councils have to pass balanced budgets. Everybody probably knows that. You can't run a deficit. And so you are seeing in this province uh, municipalities with significant tax increases being proposed every year because of a, a number of factors. And that is uh, causing affordability to be an issue. Uh, we as a municipality in Saanich take pride in trying to maintain our infrastructure and having reserve funds for that. But in order to keep up with the extensive needs, you're looking at significant investments. And so that balancing act is problematic. And our motto in Saanich is sustainable Saanich. And it has a multitude of, of uh, kind of uh, inferences, the environment uh, that we can uh, be here economically, and that we are a people who uh, respect the land, which I guess is tying into environment. But that sustainable sandwich, in my opinion, is being tested. Um, we uh, had a council meeting last night where we had a report uh, on our infrastructure needs and a, and a borrowing strategy to deal with some of our facilities replacements. We, we have a public works yard that's 40 years old and is full of ACO trailers. And so that's just not acceptable for the health and safety of our workers and to deliver a quality service. But if we do advance all of these uh, initiatives, uh, we were looking at a budget increase for 2024 of 10%. And inflation is now under four in this part of the country. So I don't know how we can justify going out to our community with 10%, even though I know in my heart, that's what you need. But you can't always do what you need within the reality of what people can afford to pay. So that affordability is a real challenge. And, and I, I think the thing that'll be interesting for you to talk to other councils around British Columbia about is, and perhaps the country, is the property tax revenue generating system the way forward as we come into the second, third decade of this century? Because I'm not sure it is. Um, it, it just is, is seemingly, a self-feeding uh, challenge because every year you're seeing these increases grow. And because Saanich is 75% residential and 25% approximately commercial, those increases are disproportionately borne on our residents. And so the appetite for services isn't diminishing. People want everything, but they don't want to pay more. And that, and that of course, is, is a fallacy. You can't have more and, and pay less. I'm going to quote Star Trek here for a second, if you don't mind, <laughs> because I do it on this show because I think it's an important question that every municipal politician struggles with. How do you weigh the community against the needs of the one? Because you talk about building housing that the community needs. You talk about a group of people, the one, who say, I don't want my neighborhood to change. 
you talk about affordability, the infrastructure projects, you have reserves, great, but you know that reserves only go a certain amount of way and you are going to come to a period of time if financially you don't stay on the path that you are, um, where you're going to potentially need to out, you, ask people for a little bit more against the community who the one is sort of struggling right now. How do you balance every issue as a community issue, knowing that the one person out there or the the community individually is struggling during this sort of hard economic time? Oh, it's a great question. And, and if there was a, uh, I think a quantitative way to answer it, I wish I could, uh, but there isn't. It's really uh, a, an adjudication situation. I was looking at data uh, in preparation for last night's meeting that showed the average Canadian worker did see a 4% increase in their wages in the last year. And so if you factor that in, well, then maybe we all should pay a little bit more in our property taxes. But then we have the people on fixed incomes who don't necessarily have that. And if their pensions, uh, if they're older adults, if their pensions aren't indexed, they may have had no increase. And so it's trying to find a balance where you leave nobody behind, but Is yet you easy? also take care. Oh. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. Is it easy? No, of course it's not easy. That's the, and I not mean that to be rude, Chris. It's, no, it, no, it really no, because is the, the, the question crux is, of what we do. The question then goes into, does it get easier to make these choices? Because the, no. these decisions are not just going to go away. The decisions about around yeah. property taxes are things that you probably were dealing with in 2014. Yeah. And now you have come to a realization that you have to adjudicate every single issue. Yeah. And the adjudication process is probably easier than it once was because yes. now you're a little bit better. So I think the better question is, does the decision-making process get easier than just the decisions of making those tough choices? Yes and no. I know that's a, an equivocating answer. Certainly, the I, I'm going to interject for a second. You like saying that because I read it, a Reddit. Yes, I did a deep dive into you. A Reddit AMA from 2014 from the previous election. And you answered many questions with yes and no. So you like that same. Yeah, I, did, I thank you for drawing it to my attention. I didn't know I did, but I believe it. Because I think if all of us who are municipal councillors would say nothing is ever black and white. Everything's a, a shade of gray. So it is yes or no. Uh, to answer the question that you posed, yes, it has become easier because you know the processes that have helped you develop the budget. And so when you get to the decision making, you say, well, I've trust the processes that's led to it. So therefore, you can vote yes. No. It's been harder because when I first got on council, we were uh, pulling our hair out, and I don't have any, haha, joke there, um, over three and 4% increases. Now we're talking eight and 10%. So it's, it's easier in that I understand the process better. And we have a process in Saanich where we talk about budget guidelines six months before we talk about our budget. So staff go and develop a budget based on what we tell them we want the budget to approximately be. So the process is the public knows and we therefore don't have a huge surprise when we get to March. It's not easier because we're talking more and more. These numbers are compounding. So when we talk about an 8% increase on last year, we're looking at about a $300 increase to the average resident. And if you are on a fixed income, that's $30 approximately a month. But that's a significant uh, uh, piece of money. The challenge is, is that there are people in our municipality who are thriving. And people who own homes are seeing an increase in the value in their homes for the most part over time. People's housing has, has doubled in value in the last 20 years on average. And so it's that housing wealth that people are sitting on, but they don't necessarily have the cash flow to make it easy to pay these increasing taxes. So it is never easy because you know the decisions you're making are going to be challenging for some people. But I think our job as council is to be as utilitarian as we can and to serve the municipality so that you're not putting the municipality in a, a situation that would be untenable. But there are uh, undoubtedly, I uh, hate to say it in this way, but winners and losers, every decision you make. And when it comes to budget, the people who are least able to afford these increases Unfortunately, uh, they have the most realistic experiences of a, a consequence as a result because they maybe can't 
uh, do something. They can't eat something. They can't take a trip. And that's heartbreaking for me. I want to still play in the sandbox, but I'm very cautious of time. Hopefully you have an extra few seconds for me. Oh, yeah. Um, you're right. At the end of the day, it truly comes down to the winners and losers. And I hate to use that way, but I've used it on this show numerous times. At the end of the day, you as a counselor are picking those winners and losers as well, because you have to make those decisions because you know, as you've said on the show, municipalities do not have an endless supply of money. You have to balance your budget every single year. Unlike the provincial government and federal government, you have to balance. How important is it when you do make these tough decisions, when you do talk about, uh, hey, unfortunately, we can't do what you need in our community because we have to worry about this area of the community first, because every community, every person believes their issue is the most important issue. But at the end of the day, you have to make the tough choices for the community. How important is, to, is it to communicate effectively yeah. with the people who do not get what they are looking for when it comes to budget season or even when it comes to that pothole being fixed, because unfortunately the pothole on ninth yeah. street is a lot worse than on 24th street. Fortunately, I would say the operational level of what potholes were pretty good at. And I know that was just an example, but it's the big things that we want to undertake as municipality that is, is challenging. I think the key is being transparent and being willing to communicate whether or not it's online, whether or not it's through a phone call, whether or not it's expressing why you voted the way you did during a budget meeting. So the, the key is to explain to people why you made your decision. And if you can do that in a way that is respectful and always with the understanding, we are doing the best we can. And you show that over a period of time so that people hopefully will then believe you have integrity when you tell them this. So from my perspective, I am always willing to take a phone call, even though I don't get stopped in the grocery store all that often. I do respond to all the emails that come to me. And if they come to me directly, I'll often even just say, hey, do you want to get together for a coffee? Because email isn't always the best way to get together to talk about an issue because tone is so impossible to read. So uh, it, it's hard, but the secret is communication and a willingness to be transparent, which it, these are almost cliches, uh, but th they're cliches because they're true. And if people are willing to believe that you are willing to, pardon me, if people understand that you're willing to defend your decision in a way that's respectful, I often will end a lot of conversations with, I disagree with you, but I understand where you're coming from. Thank you. And that to me, even though you wish everybody would agree, I can live with that because we're not all going to agree. You look at the disparate uh, political uh, state of our country federally, and we are all so disparately entrenched in our belief system that it's it's if you can get 50 percent now wouldn't that be wonderful so at the municipal level um i always just let people know why i voted the way i did and welcome the feedback but just always i i also a school teacher that directs plays and so i often will see a little bit of overlap between the two and when you're telling a student why they didn't get a role perhaps in a play and and you just have to say i did what i think was right to serve the play and so that's often the expression I use in council will be, I'm doing what I think is right for Sandwich. Asking a teacher question right now, but yeah. as, a, as a theater director, um, what, what's, what's the spring musical this year? What's the, th the spring show for you this year? I got to put you on the spot here because I'm oh, coming to Sandwich. So I want to see this live in person. <laughs> All right. Well, it's the day that we're taping this is the day after the second semester of two in our school system here in Saanich started. So yesterday we started a rehearsal process of introducing the musical, Anything Goes. It's a Cole Porter 1930s classic set on a cruise liner that's going from New York to London. We're performing it in May and June. And if you're out here in uh, this neck of the woods uh, in that time, I would love to have you be our guest. Hey, anything I can do, you can do better. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Let's do it. Uh I, as a gay You're kid growing up in rural Ontario, I knew all about the musical. <laughs> so anything I'm goes. I'm so impressed. I'm so um, impressed that you threw that pun in. <laughs> I want to turn to my favorite subject now. And as I said, I've made a pledge on this show. If you come to, if you come on this show, I come to your community and I spend my yeah. dollars. So my husband and I will be in Saanich later in the summer. So be sure yeah. to probably hopefully in June so I can see the show, anything goes. But what are some of the tourist highlights that people need to stop in and see in Saanich? I think the thing that makes Saanich unique and why people want to live here and why they come here 
is that we actually have a wonderful blend of residential and rural and natural areas. We have, I think it's 160 parks uh, in our municipality. So we have parks almost everywhere. And as a result, you can connect to nature here, whether or not it's a small pocket park, whether or not it's a playground style park, or if it's more of a sanctuary style park. So as far as tourist attractions, we don't have, for example, the Butchart Garden, which is just proximal and central sandwich, but we do have a horticultural center. So you could come and see that. We have the college uh, uh, known as Camosun College. We have the University of Victoria, which has wonderful uh, park uh, around its campus as well. So for us, I would say in Saanich, it's the environment and I would say the people. We are a very multicultural community. 25% of our municipality are not first generation Canadians. Uh, pardon me, the other way around, our first generation Canadians. And so as a result of that, we have a really, uh, I think, a very multicultural community that knows we are better together. And so when you come here, I think you will enjoy it. We have low crime. Uh, we are proximal to Victoria, which we know has some challenges with homelessness and with crime because most of the services that support these uh people in need are based in the city. So Saanich by comparison feels quite safe. Obviously every municipality will have its challenges, but I think if you came to Saanich, what you would enjoy was the feeling of being connected to nature and yet close to a lot of services. And we have excellent recreational opportunities. So it's, it's a place that doesn't have a Disneyland, but we are a place where if you come here, I promise you will feel like you've come more somewhere special. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to it. And I have one last question for you. Sure. So we started the interview talking about yourself, talking about the role of counselor. We're ending by talking about the municipality as a whole. And I asked this question because I know every municipal leader needs to know how to answer this. And I think they do know how to answer this. So let's put it on the record. In your opinion, what makes the District of Saanich such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I know you already answered a little bit, but expand a little bit more if you don't mind. I think it's a combination of our commitment to the environment, to social well-being, and economic opportunity. We know that these three pillars are intertwined, and you can't have one without the other and be sustainable. So I think that's what makes Saanich unique. And the fact that the people who live in Saanich are so diverse, both in age and cultural backgrounds. And it's, it's a place where our motto is everybody belongs. Everyone is welcome. And so it, it is a place that I think aspires to some of the ideals that we have in Canada. And that is economic opportunity, a respect for the environment, and the understanding that social well-being is important as well. And, and in Saanich here, I, I would be remiss to not acknowledge our commitment to also work with neighboring First Nations who have stewarded this land for millennia. And in Saanich, that's a real key aspect to our vision moving forward because we are on the territories of nations that have been here for thousands of years. And so we're not ignorant to the fact that we are uh, new in reality to the nations that have been here for thousands of years. So I think we are a healthy community that realizes we need to move forward, but we also have to be respectful in how we do that. Colin, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, I am more now than ever looking forward to visiting Sandwich because I always enjoy a good theater piece. So hopefully the kids don't disappoint and you do wonderful jobs directing them because I know it is a challenging, challenging book uh, that you have ahead of you. So good luck and thank you so much for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. This was really enjoyable. Thank you for having me on. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage from coast to coast to coast committed to keeping you well-informed as well as well-engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of this top-notch program that you have come to love and enjoy. 
Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.